supplied me with my every need. All my hope is in you. You're all that I look to, and I'll sing forever. I sing that I am. Give me some sound, sir. Yeah. All right. This is not. I'm not hearing anything, my friend. Nope. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, it's on. Can you get that welcome slide, Steve? All right. All kinds of tech stuff today. Watch this. Magic hand. Oh, there we go. 
Sorry, online folks. You know what? Turn that thing off. I got a voice. My mama trained me. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> there was a Charles Spurgeon that said in a, in a lecture to some students, he said, I pity those guys who have uh, small lungs and small stature because they can't speak over the room. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, it's a Methodist church. Maybe you don't know Spurgeon. But welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, those who are joining online, feel free to let us know you're here. Uh, let us know what you're thankful for as we move throughout the service. Those who are here, feel free to um, uh, use the prayer station to leave the behind wall. Anything that may be distracting uh, you uh, from being able to move through this courts and worship this morning. Uh, you just leave your distraction on the wall. There's coffee. Julie, half-made coffee. So we better give her a hand. I have coffee. We have some difficulties. We're having all kinds of technical difficulties today. And I'm, and I'm hesitant to say, you know, we want to cast the, the, the adversary out of it. I think it's, it's operator error. So, <laughs> anyway, it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, and we've got a few things going on today. Sarah's going to start us off with, with, some, uh, with a big moment. And then we also have a guest speaker today. So, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So that's exciting. So I always enjoy coming up here in the first place. So technical difficulties. You what if you have you been at home? Whatever you're not on the mic, they can't hear. You step up here, right? So yeah. Hi. Sorry. No, it's all right. You've been that guy. <laughs> we use we use green. green. Mine won't reach you. Okay. All right, I'll move. I can go. It's too quiet. I can go. I can even go up to here. Oh. <laughs> I don't have heels on today, so i got to get as high as I can. <laughs> so good morning. Good morning. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Sarah Daniels. And today I am coming to you just as a child of God. So no agenda of student ministries or next gen, any of that. Just to come up here to see, tell you what I see. So for the past nine years, I've been in this position, and I've heard, oh, Sarah, you do such a good job, I could never do your job. Well, the truth is, I don't think I do a great job. I know that'll shock you guys, but um, I didn't have any training coming into this job. And so when I sat down in front of Russ and Nathan, I'm like, are you sure you want to hire me? Like, I've been in construction 15 years, like... I barely know the Bible. I did Discipleship 101. Like, so you sure you want me to lead the kids? And I'm like, yeah, I think this is going to work. And for somehow it did. Um, so part of the growth I've seen over nine years was um, COVID did a blessing for me. And I know, like, that's kind of hard to hear. And for me, <clears throat> COVID ta taught me how to sit still. COVID taught me how to go into my Bible app every day and do a daily devotion. Um, it was hard, because, but that was one thing I had been praying about, was knowing God more. And so COVID gave me the time. To, I did a 90-day one, because <laughs> we had all the time in the world to sit still, right, and listen to God. And so as of today... I have completed 205 daily devotions in the Bible app, so that makes me really happy. Granted, a lot of them are like three, five days, seven days, but that still gets me in the Word every day. So I am grateful for that blessing that um, that hard time has brought all of us. And so what I try to do is take that gift of being in the Bible every day, and for when somebody comes up to me and says, I just, I just want to know more. And I'm like, hey, do you got a phone? Like, let's do this. Like, become my friend on the app. Um, every week I kick off a new devotion. I invite a whole bunch of people and see who joins us that week. And whoever does, then we talk about it and we move on. So it's interesting to see, like, who kind of hangs on there. Um, and then some that have, let's get busyness of life um, take us. And I'm, I'll be honest, when I'm at camp, I don't do it. <laughs> I'm a little busy at camp. So... Um, I try to bring that gift to other people, and um, <coughs> part of what the daily devotion has me doing as I sit still, it also teaches me to listen. When we, 
when we sit and we read it and we reflect on it, we also need that time to listen. How many, I need a response from you guys right now. How many of you guys enjoy listening? Just raise your hand. Do you enjoy listening? Okay. Okay, so I'm hoping the other ones will raise their hand when I say, do you enjoy talking? (laughs) Yes, Vistaya, Vistaya, Mara, yes. So, I mean, some of us have the gift of both, right? But James 1.19 says, my brothers and sisters, take note. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to get angry. Now, what does that mean for us today? I've had some great mentors in my life. And I can name just several off the top of my head. Like Tom Neihart, he was my high school mentor. He was just a a 20 something um, spiritual man that um, we met at uh, Arby's in Warsaw. And I would say, okay, I don't know what my path is because it doesn't match my friends. And he's like, just be faithful. And in a time that it was not easy to be faithful, like. It took a lot. Now he's a pastor of South Bend College Ministries. So um, so that was great. Uh, Yvonne Nickham, she was my first heart-to-heart mentor we had here. It was a women's ministry where we mentored one another um, in the 2000s. Uh, she was my first. And it was great for me because I was at a time where uh, I was pregnant and my mom was an hour away. And so she helped mentor me through that. Uh, Sue Simon, uh, she uh, taught me so many things about uh, ancestry and all that stuff. Um, And Barb Stedge, she was a great mentor to me. Um, She's the one that taught Discipleship 101 with her husband, and um, her passing is going to mean a lot to a lot of people. Mentoring is just listening. Giving somebody time to just listen. So those who raised your hand and said you like to listen, that's what mentoring is. They don't need all the answers. They just need the gift of God and the gift of listening. And there should be a slide there, Steve. Did I get in there? The Fort Wayne community slide? Yeah. Yeah. So Fort Wayne Community Schools is seeing this need for mentoring. There's a lot of kids out there that don't get people to listen to them. They don't need us to fix their problems. Sometimes they just need somebody to listen. And so Jessica Hanna um, has become a quick friend of mine this past year. She's having a lunch and learn. And um, if you're interested in going to this, let me know and I can get you the link to sign up. They're trying, Fort Wayne Community Schools is trying to partner, uh, match up people to be mentors to kids in school. And so for me, I'm just mentoring. I'm not running it. I'm gonna go and sit with some ki- a kid, maybe for lunch, 45 minutes, twice a month. And she's gonna at least give you some commonality if she matches. They just need somebody to listen. And if you're a great listener, this is a great, easy gift that you can give somebody. So let's pray. Lord, as we go out into the community, as those of us who like to talk, this is the great challenge of listening. Those of us who are great listeners, Lord, just use our ears to hear your children to be that mentor in their life, that they'll just recall that one person that just sat with them and listened to them. Lord, help us to be your faithful servants in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Sarah. Let's continue to move through this course this morning. Will you stand with me? We need to greet each other so we know who we're worshiping with this morning, yeah? So let's greet each other real quick. All right. We're going to listen to songs of praise for our God this morning. He is holy. We don't just sing, we pray, we proclaim the truth about our faith. And we stand and listen.
this. Here we go. We stand in the lift of our hands. Come on. Thank you. 
Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. Uh, we're going to share in a moment of prayer. Before we uh, take that time to pray, are there any concerns that people have this morning? I will share uh, Barb Sedge uh, passed away this week, so we need to keep her family in our prayers. Um, also, my wife is going to have hip replacement surgery. We still don't know when, but so that's something that, you know, certainly I want us to keep in our prayers. Anything else? Yeah, see. I was scheduled for a bone scan this Friday to uh, make sure the cancer hasn't gotten into there, so pray that it uh, that comes back negative. Yes, prayers for Steve's medical test that everything comes back good on that. Dr. Gartman, maybe you know him from First Wayne Street. Uh, he just had a hip replaced on Friday, so he's in the grips of it right now, so pray okay. that he'll walk and move prayers, more. Prayers for Roger that he will recover uh, quickly and relatively pain free. <laughs> you, you can come here then. That's a prayer ball. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can gather in your presence, that we can come to you uh, both with our joys and with our concerns, and we know that you will hear them, that you will celebrate those joys with us and that you will hear those concerns and you will act on them. 
in a way that only you can. And so as we gather this morning, Father, we pray especially that you be with the Stedge family on the passing of Barb. We, uh, she was uh, truly an important part of this church. And so, Father, we want to take time and, and remember her and celebrate everything that she did here and, and take time to, to really grieve and understand what, what that loss is going to mean to us. Uh, Father, we ask that you be with Roger as he recovers from his hip replacement. Uh, that can be a, a long process. And so, Father, we just pray that you help it to, to go quickly and with relatively little pain. Uh, Father, we ask a special uh, prayer for Steve that as he goes through tests this week, uh, that we will get good results, that the cancer will not have spread, and that he will be able to uh, pursue treatments which will uh, bring him back to, to full health. Uh, Father, for the many unspoken requests, we just ask that you be with all of those this morning. You know what they are, and you know what the needs are, and we know that you will uh, help each of those people in kind. And so, Father, we just ask all of these things, and we gather here this morning just giving you all of our praise, all of our love, all of our worship, and we just ask that you receive our gifts, receive our love, and just know that, that we are your servants. Father, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to try to do this without uh, standing up and way up there with that microphone. And for those of you that have just tuned in, uh, we're having some mic issues, so hopefully you can uh, hear me. I'm standing a little closer to the camera because of that. Um, this morning we are uh, uh, very happy to welcome uh, Reverend Angelo Manti to uh, uh, speak to us. Um, Angelo is from Fort Wayne but, uh, but spent some time in Atlanta and was called back to Fort Wayne uh, to lead a ministry that uh, he is leading right now. He's the Executive Director of Alive Community Outreach. Uh, um, I, there's a little bit of information in your bulletin about that, uh, and we'll put a, a website address online for you guys in, a, in just a, a few minutes. Um, uh, we've had several people that have, have supported his ministry from St. Joe, and uh, a couple that are on his board right now, um, and uh, uh, we are just happy to have him come speak to us uh and so i'm i'm going to make keep this short and let him have the time so uh uh here's reverend angelo manti good morning, good morning. it just occurred to me you know what i'm gonna take this off i know my wire is dangling back there but that's okay <laughs> it just occurred to me as i was sitting at the table and just worshiping that this is my first time in church in about a month, which doesn't happen too often when you're when you're clergy. But uh, we were on vacation, and then I just uh, last week last weekend I was visiting my aunt uh, Rosie down in Florida, who was just put in hospice, and she's got a matter of of days, probably um, a couple weeks uh, at best. And so this has been a heavy time for our family and. Good to be in church. It's good to be in church. I can't be the only one. It's good to be in church, right? Right. Well, I uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to come and, and share today, and I thank Pastor Mitch for the invitation and all of you for uh, having me here today. You may not know, he mentioned that uh, there are some pretty significant connections to St. Joe that I have and that our ministry has. Uh, I don't know if you know the name Tom Beaver. I'm sure some of you do. Uh, Tom is a longtime member of this church, and he was our first board member. Actually, he was on our steering team uh, as I was recruiting uh, folks to be on that back in 2018 before we even started this uh, ministry, before we uh, became a 501c3. And so Tom has been on our board. He has been our board chair. He just stepped down from that role, but uh, he is, is still serving on our board. And he and his wife, Sandy, have been great friends to my, to my family. And then uh, Doug Worthington and Russ Abel, two other names you might might be familiar with, they serve on our board. Doug's our treasurer, and, and Russ, as our, as our DES, we have an ex-officio spot on our board for whoever the district superintendent is, but he's been fully engaged, and Doug has been great 
Um, I'm just going to keep name dropping. That's the entire <laughs> content of my message today. Now, I only got one more name to drop, and that is uh, Sarah Daniels. Uh, we uh, have the privilege of serving together on the Children Matter Most team. How many of you have heard of Children Matter Most? Come on now. <laughs> Sorry, that's good. So we serve on this team, Children Matter Most, which is uh, it's an initiative that uh, was, was started by Bishop Trimble. And it's, it's an initiative focused on children. It's an initiative that affirms that children are our most valuable resource. And we share Jesus' heart for children. We desire to see all children in our community, in our conference, and beyond have the opportunity to thrive. But that is not the case, is it? What ought to be isn't what is. Kids in our community are living in poverty. Kids in our community are hungry, living with parents who are addicted to drugs, uh, witnessing domestic violence, experiencing violence directly in their homes, in their communities. And so there are many, many, many ways that kids here in our own neighborhoods are experiencing trauma. There are a lot of children among us who are suffering. And so the Children Matter Most team at our core were focused on, first of all, raising awareness about the ways that kids are struggling in our community. We're highlighting ministries in local churches throughout the, the conference, in, in local churches that are responding to, to needs. Um, you know what? I think I'm loud enough that I can just well, you might need, do you need this for the video? I don't. Okay. I can cut it off and just speak let's, louder. Uh, let's try this one. Check, check, check. Hey, what's <laughs> okay, let's go with this one. I've had it up to here with tech dick. That's a hack. <laughs> and if, you're, if your cable dangles, it's... Yeah. <laughs> All right, try. All right, let's try this. Let's turn it down. And so we're about, we're about raising awareness. We're about highlighting ministries in our conference that are meeting the needs and responding to the needs of children and then gathering resources that can help us all as, as we all in our own communities and our churches respond to the needs of children. And so there are three focus areas of this initiative, partnering with local schools. We saw some pretty cool ways that you are looking to do that here at St. Joe. So how can we come alongside our, our schools as we, as we support children? The second is nonviolence. So how can we empower youth to be peacemakers? I'll say more about that here in a little bit with the work that, that we're doing. And then the third focus area of this initiative is food insecurity. So how are we as the church called to respond to this, this crisis of so many children and families in our own community that don't have access to affordable, healthy food. And so these are the three focus areas of children matter most. But the ministry that I lead, Alive Community Outreach, we are heavily focused on the first two areas. So nonviolence, peacemaking, and partnering with with local schools. And so I want to share a little bit this morning about the work that we're doing, but first I want to give you some, some context because you may or may not know our story. Some of you may know our story, a little bit about our background, but for those who don't, it all started for us back in 2016 in September when I got a call that my first cousin was killed. He was murdered here in Fort Wayne. And he was like a little brother to me growing up. Uh, this is just a devastating uh, situation for my family, and, and it still is uh, this many years later. And so my wife and I, our children, we were living in Atlanta, Georgia, where we'd been since 2009. I was serving as the, the campus minister at one of our United Methodist Children's Homes down there. I absolutely adored my work. I'd still be there today. I could have been there forever. I loved it. But my wife and I, we felt God calling us back home to do something about this issue of violence. We were tracking this issue even before my cousin was killed. 2016 ended up being a record-breaking year for homicides here in Fort Wayne, and that decade, 2010 to 2020, ended up being the worst decade on record for homicides here in our community. And so we felt God calling us to come back home. We didn't know exactly what we'd be doing, 
We didn't, we didn't know where we'd be even. Um, the way the appointment cycle uh, works down there, I had to let them know that I wasn't going to return before I had anything figured out up here. But we just knew that God was calling us back home. And so in the summer of 2017, we were here. And that whole first year, we spent a lot of time just learning. Just learning, just trying to get to wrap our heads or wrap our minds around this, this issue. And so we sought out lots of conversations with community leaders, with, with pastors and churches, with organizations that are addressing this, this problem of violence from different angles. And most importantly, we sought out lots and lots of conversations with families, families who'd been affected by violence. And so we started to meet a whole lot of these families and one of the things that was surprising to me and disturbing to me was that many families, even most families, I'd say, that we were encountering had experienced this multiple times. So not just once. So, so my situation with my family was something of an anomaly uh, among victims that we were meeting and that we were working with. And so as we met family after family who had lost someone to murder or had lost multiple people to murder, we became really disturbed by what we were finding. We especially were disturbed by how many children there are who are affected by this, who just go under the radar. Our data goes back to 2005, and there's around 550 murders in our community since 2005. Just think about how many people that represents as far as who, who, who are, are affected, the people that are affected, the children that are affected by this. And there are so many children that we were encountering who hadn't received any support at all. No support, no services. They just lost their father, lost their mother, lost their brother, and went to the funeral, took a couple days off school, and then went right back to school, and no support. Just completely into the radar. And so that's where we started. We started with, with supporting these kids. We started taking kids out to Aaron's house. That's the very one of the very first things that we did. We actually used your church bus on a few occasions. Thank you. You may not know that, but we did just a few years ago. Took kids to Aaron's house, connected families with other support services in the community, trying to connect families with local churches. We ended up starting our own support group for families. We uh, partnered with Taylor Chapel United Methodist and, and uh, started this Christmas gifts program for, for children, specifically for children who've been affected by violence. And so all of this eventually evolved into where we're at today with our co-victim care program. We hired a part-time person over a year ago. We just was able to hire her full-time. So she started full-time this past Monday as our director of co-victim care. And this program is focused on coming alongside families who've been affected by violence, helping them heal, helping them to transform their pain into purpose. The scripture that took root for us early on was John chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Who knows what that is off the top of your head? Bible quiz. Anybody? The thief comes only to what? Steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it in abundance, have it to the full. And so our name, Alive, if you wonder where that comes from, Alive bears witness to this verse. The thief of violence is active. The thief of violence is alive and well and wreaking havoc in our community. Yes, but Jesus is also alive and well. And he came for the purpose that we might have life, that our community might have life and have it in abundance. And so we're claiming that for our community. And so what does abundant life look like? Where is abundant life lacking here in Fort Wayne, in our neighborhoods? And the more we engaged with families, the more we engaged with victims, the more we did funerals, done so many funerals, 21 years old, 25 years old, 19 years old, all young people. No one, 30 is the oldest that I've done. The more we did this, the more urgent this question became of what can we do to break this cycle? What can we do to break this cycle? 
God has called us to support victims, and as long as there are victims to support, we'll be there to help. We'll be there to support. But what can we do to work toward becoming a community in which there are less families to support in the first place? So as we were asking questions like this, we started to meet more and more young people who wanted to do something about it, who wanted to do something about this problem of violence. Young people who were telling us that they're tired of losing friends, that they're tired of seeing people killed, they're tired of all the fights that they see at school and the bullying and the online harassment, that they're just tired of it. They want to do something about it, but they don't know where to start. And so we prayed about this. And after a lot of prayer and discernment, we felt God calling us to start another program as part of, of our ministry. Only this program would equip and empower young people to be peacemakers, to do something about this problem of violence. And so with that, our Peacemaker Academy program was born. I have a video here to show you in a, in a moment, so if you could cue that up uh, for me, please. But just to give you a brief overview of what our academy is, Peacemaker Academy, it's a three-week summer program that's focused on equipping young people with skills and tools to deal with conflict, to deal with their own conflicts, but also to deal with conflicts that they see in their school, in their neighborhood, in constructive ways. And right now, we're working exclusively with Southside High School students. We had to start somewhere, so we started there. But we're hoping to expand this program to other schools, hopefully to, to all schools uh, here, in, in at least in Fort Wayne Community Schools. But during this academy, stud students learn things like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s principles and steps of nonviolence, if you're familiar with that. We learn about different types of violence. Uh, different levels of violence, de-escalation strategies. Students learn how to deal with their own internal violence, with their anger, with their trauma. They learn how to organize effectively. Because if, if, if one person wants to make a difference, you can make a difference. But if a group of people mobilize to make a difference, wow. Well, 12 people. We have 12 students in our academy every year. 12, Jesus took 12 disciples and, and changed the course of history. Uh, so teaching them to come together and organize and mobilize for social change in their schools and their neighborhoods. They learn how to analyze root problems. We talk about violence as a symptom. Anytime there's fights or shootings or any kind of violence, what's really going on underneath that? Let's analyze it at the root level. And so there's all kinds of, of stuff that they learn in this academy. But my favorite part is we help them to take all of what they learn and implement it at school. This isn't a, a theoretical, hypothetical thing. So the, the academy culminates with them developing a plan, developing a project of some kind to build peace in their school. But then we walk with them throughout the course of the school year and help them to do it. And so I could go on and on about this program and our experience with it has been amazing. But I'm going to show you a video, and this is from... Uh, last year, our video, we just uh, concluded this year's academy a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and uh, our video isn't quite done yet, but this is from last year, but some of these students, this is the other cool part, some of these students helped us to teach this year's group of students, and so... How do I feel about this academy? I feel like this is a, a great learning process that everyone around my age should go through. It was delightful. Um, a lot of people here are good people, and so I'm surrounded by a lot of people that actually are ready and willing to make a change, and that's why I'm happy to be here. It, how has it impacted my life? It impacted it well. Like, I learned how to meditate and how to uh, solve problems more peacefully. I feel very full of, like, a bunch of knowledge. I don't know how to solve conflict on my own, so learning about nonviolence and how to like resolve conflict in a healthy way has really helped my relationships and just my overall mental health. 
I used to be violent, very violent. I used to want to put my hands on people if they say something. Mm -hmm. But ever since I joined the academy and started learning about nonviolence. Nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. If you can be nonviolent in a violent situation, that makes you a really strong, brave person. Like when you think of nonviolence, you think like someone's yelling in your face and you just have to sit there or, you know, someone's picking on you and you just have to ignore it. Nonviolence is not just letting somebody run over you. It's more so not reacting physically, but, you know, still attacking them mentally. When the detectives and the police came talking about snitches, it's not a bad thing to tell the truth. I go throughout my day thinking of different ways I could handle situations. No more of the yelling, no more of the arguing, just talk it out. I don't want to be labeled as a ghetto school anymore. I'm tired of the South is bad, South is this and that. My hopes are we will have a beloved community at Southside. Just everybody coming together and just learning. Um, how to work with each other and how to just create more peace throughout the school. I hope for the future of Southside is just a peaceful community. I think the teachers and the students can help build it by just communicating. I feel like communication is something that we lack. Just hearing students out more and helping them out in situations that they need help in instead of trying to be the top tier. I feel like if they help teach peace and help move around the word, a lot of students can actually help. Try to understand where we come from, you know what I'm saying, as, our, as kids or not kids, teenagers. Communicate better and respect one another. I feel like that's a big thing, is like respect. If we're going to commit to practicing nonviolence and trying to make it better, we have to stick to the plan. I hope that we continue this peaceful nonviolence movement. I do believe other schools can have a peacemaker counter, but it would take time for sure. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So, thank you. So this first year uh, group of students, uh, some of them graduated and are, are off to college and doing other things now, but uh, we have a handful of them who are still at school. So those, those students from last year and uh, the, the students that we had just go through the academy, we're all working together now. We've been, the, the academy is only three weeks and they have an incentive, a $750 incentive. We pay students to be, to be a part of the academy. Um, but once the academy is over, their incentive is, is internal. You know, the, and every single one of our students has stayed engaged after the three weeks. And so right now we're working with the administration on a number of, of things to, that we're doing at the school. Uh, we're working, we're helping them to plan a peace week. So the September 21st is the International Day of Peace. September 25th is the National Day of Remembrance for Murder Victims. And so we're, we're organizing a peace week there at, at the school and working with the admin team to do that. They've asked us, they have something called Archer Period. So on Fridays, they have 50 minutes where they do something around character development. And they've asked us to take one Friday a month where we have the whole 50 minutes for the entire school to do something around peace building and, and nonviolence. Uh, there's, they're working on a, a peace counter, which is gonna be a, a, a display, a digital display in the commons area at school that shows how many uh, cumulative and consecutive days without a fight that they've had. And there, there are going to be school-wide incentives for, for not fighting and for, for, uh, for having peace in the school. Uh, and so they're, they're working on a peace club uh, so they can widen the net and more students can be involved. There, there's a number of things that they're working on. Uh, but the thing is, is they're doing it. The students are doing it. We're just equipping them, supporting them, helping them to, to think through uh, their, their strategy. But they are doing it. You know, we often say that young people are the future, which they are. But these students are reminding us every day that they're also the present. Young people can and are called to make a difference now. And these young people are doing that in a powerful way. It's just our job, our job as adults, our job as the church to equip them, to empower them. I was reminded a few days ago in a pretty terrifying way of um, 
just how critical this work is. I, I live a little bit south of downtown, and I was at my back door. It was a little after 11 o'clock at night. And I was, I was at my back door. The door was open. I was, it's an old house. Something's always broken. And so I was messing with the door, and next thing I know, I heard pop, 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 loud. Like, I, we've heard shots before in our neighborhood. This, is, this was like, I, I thought that I might be getting shot at. That's how close it was. It was right on top of me. And so I got down on the ground, and I literally crawled up. There's a little stairwell from the back door up to the main floor. Crawled up the stairs, crawled to safety. And as soon as I got to a safe place, I got on my phone. We have cameras around our house, and I checked the footage. And when I was able to retrieve the footage, what I saw was two boys, probably 11, 12 years old, couldn't have been any older than that, running away, running down, running away from my alley, running down the street, away from the scene. They apparently hadn't shot at anybody. Uh, they shot one of our neighbor's car windows out. They broke into a car and um, used a gun to do that. I mean, to tell kids, you don't need guns to break into cars, kids. Um, <laughs> To be part of our Sunday school lesson. <laughs> this this foot has raised a lot more questions than it did answers. You know, what are these kids doing out so late at night, running the neighborhood? Where did they get a gun? Right? Why are you using a gun to break into to a car? So there's lots of questions that this footage raises, and we don't have the answers to this question, these questions, but I do know, we spoke about this a little at annual conference in our Children Matter Most um, report, that gun violence is now the leading cause of death for children and teens in our country. The leading cause of death. And if we don't work assertively to make peace, that's why I love this word, peacemaking. Right? We're called to pray for peace, hope for peace, but this word is active. Right? We have to make peace, we have to make it happen. If we don't work assertively to make peace in our community, then more and more children, and frankly all of us, will suffer. Friends, Jesus came bring us life, to give us abundant life. You and I are his hands and feet. If you want to help, and I'll be around if you want to have a conversation after this, but I'll just rattle off a few ways that you can help. Um, pray, first of all, pray. Pray for our ministry. Uh, pray for, for me and my team. Pray for our families who are affected by violence. Pray for peace in our city. Just pray. Give financially. Financial support is always helpful. We're a young ministry uh, working towards sustainability. And so uh, we appreciate uh, your gifts. If you're interested in volunteering and, and doing the work, uh, with our young people, with our families, let's have a conversation. We'll try to plug, plug you into something that fits your gifts and graces. And then lastly, this has nothing to do with, with Alive, with our ministry um, in particular, but just in general. Get engaged with kids. Get engaged with young people if you aren't already. And I know, know that this is a church that's heavily engaged with youth. And many, if not all of you, are already engaged. But if you're not, if you're not getting gays, whatever capacity you can, whether it's tutoring, uh, just showing up for, for a kid, uh, being there. Uh, there is a kid out there somewhere that needs you. And so if you're not engaged, do whatever you can to get engaged. Because friends, children are our most valuable resource. Our most valuable resource. They are the future, but they're also the present. So may the God of abundant life inspire us and compel us all to work toward a better, safer community for all of God's children.
Amen. Amen. Thanks a lot, Angelo. And, and uh, uh, actually, if you were here last week, that that sounded a lot like what I implored you to do, and that this was a specific example of how you can get involved. And so. Uh, please take that to heart. Um, uh, if you do want to give financially, uh, 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 the website is in the bulletin. Put it online. Um, if you want to give here, just just mark it alive, and we'll take care of that. Uh, but uh, but we do appreciate all that uh, that Angelo and his team is doing. Uh, Jesus said, "Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God." We're going to move now into Holy Communion. Uh, if you don't have a, a cup, you can raise your hand and Erica will bring you one of those. And our uh, our communion is open to anyone who calls on Jesus as their Savior. The night before he died, he sat around the table with his friends and he took some bread and he broke it and blessed it, told them, this is my body, <coughs> broken for you. Every time you eat it, remember me. Remember what I've done for you. And after supper, he took a cup of wine and he blessed it and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Every time you drink of it, remember me and what I've done for you. So, Lord, we ask that you bless these elements. Let them be for us your body and blood so that we can be the body and blood for the rest of the world. In your name we pray. Amen. If you haven't already, take your wafer. The body of Christ, broken for you, take and eat. blood of Christ shed for you take and drink Lord we do ask that you help us fill us with your Holy Spirit let us be your body and your blood we pray this in your holy name Amen Amen thank you Angelo and Mitch. Let's stand together. Let's sing one last song uh, before we move out into the world. Oh, we have an announcement. Oh, we. We'll sing a short song. <laughs> Boy, today is awesome. What, could we, we want to do the announcement yeah. first? I'll do the song first. Okay. Well, friends, let's rock and roll first. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Today's one of those days where it's like, Mike, don't make plans. Just do what I tell you to do. I'm not. not. God. Yeah, God tell me. <laughs> Sorry. I have those. I have those moments where it's just, Mike, be humble. <laughs> so let's sing about that. Can we just sing the chorus of this song and petition the Lord? Uh, we ask these things. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. So we sing together. Give us clean hands. Oh, give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts, let us not lift our souls to another, give us Give us clean hands, 
and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Amen, friends. Amen. Well, that's hard to follow. Thank you, Angelo. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Um, I'm here with SPRC, and we've got some parties coming up. So, y'all, come eat, come party, right? We've got comings and goings as we lift our hearts to God. Next Sunday is the retirement party for Barry Davis. Reception with cake and gluten-free options. All right? Your role is to come, and if you want us to stream it, we will. Your role is to thank him to be there. Amazing work. Sunday after that, so August 21st, right? The potluck is back, right? The man we're, we're sending forth to Mount Olive, he requested the potluck for fellowship, fried chicken, and fruit pie. All right? So come, be there. There are sign-ups in the hallway for what you'd like to bring and if you'd like to work or that sort of thing. Moving is hard, so please, books need boxes. Pray for Pastor Mitch. Pray for Mount Olive. And, and we're, we're accepting gifts and um, cards. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, shoot, the big one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best day. <laughs> Hurry. So, God blesses us mightily, like Angelo said, whether it's our bus or gifts or whatever. And God has called Sarah to be a full time minister at Camp Adventure. She is the program manager. She'll be running camps all summer. She'll be leading retreats throughout the year. She'll be blessing and pulling, pulling to God. Thank you. We lose her December 31st. So, she needs to train you. So step forward. Come on, this fall, you get to be mentored by her, by the best. We love you. In this house, sir. <laughs> pray for us. God, we give you thanks for this day. Give you thanks for the folks here in this in this room and at this church. And God, I don't know. I just just. Uh, Thinking about that boy in my neighborhood. I don't know what his name is, God, but I just feel uh, you leading me to pray for him specifically, for those two boys. However old they are, 11, 12, we know where, that, where this path leads. And we know that society is unforgiving because by the time they're 17 or 18 and they commit a heinous act of violence, they're just monsters. But at least now, maybe we can see them as kids. And we know it's not just them, God, but there are kids all over our city and beyond who are going down that same path. Or give us eyes to see them. When kids that are, are, are troubled walk into our doors, acting up and acting out, God, let us see it as a blessing that you've called them to us. And I thank you that this is a church, God. That St. Joe is a church that opens its doors, that opens its hearts to children and youth. Thank you, Lord. May the God of abundant life 
and peace. Go with you each, today and always. Amen. Amen.